So we have a nice panel discussion for you next, and it's all about attraction and retention. What can we all learn from high turnover industries? And this panel, we have the Chief Marketing Officer of Daily Pay, the Senior Vice President, Global Talent Management at Marriott, the VP of HR at Giant Food Stores, and we have Robert Schultz from Dial America. Everyone, please give them a nice warm welcome to the stage. Hey, everybody. On? Okay, great. Here we go. So th uh, t this is meant to be a workshop, so you're all meant to actually participate and raise your hands and ask questions as we go through. We prepared a few questions, and we certainly can speak for 40 minutes. We don't want to, um, but we would prefer to have a, an ongoing dialogue with you. So I, I'm thrilled and honored to be with this esteemed panel of experts in, in HR and focused on high turnover companies. You know, it, I'm new to daily pay, and I'm the chief innovation and marketing officer. Um, I came from Mercer, where I was the global chief marketing officer for a few years. So I've been involved with HR for a long time, but was truly kind of blown away when I started to read statistics about companies with higher than 100% turnover rates in a year, um, especially in quick service organizations, healthcare organizations, and you know anything having to do with hospitality. So I, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to moderate this panel. I'm not going to speak much because I feel that if you're in a service provider role, your job is be quiet and let the experts speak. But I am going to facilitate the conversation. OK. and. Um, I gave you my background and happy to answer any questions afterwards. But a, a quick show of hands, how many people are working with high turnover companies? No, so there's a few. Okay, so great. So we've got a great audience that's actually going to be interested in what we're saying. So, so score one for us right, right there. So um, we set up a set of six questions that we thought would kind of walk you through the challenges that are happening right now. But again, we do want all of your feedback. My first question to the entire panel is, you know, what do you think the main cause of high turnover rates are these days throughout various industries? And do you think that it's changed as different generations have started to enter the workforce? I'm not sure. I'll start. Uh, I think we've all heard over the years that the biggest driver of turnover is your supervisor. Uh, so certainly, you know, the, the easy answer is, oh, more money, better benefits. But the reality is, is if your supervisor is not keeping or your manager is not keeping you engaged, if you're not part of where the company's going, if you're stagnant in your current roles or responsibilities, uh, you, you tend to lose focus, you tend to not feel part of the team. And that's what leads individuals to go look for other opportunities. So in my mind, I think your direct supervisor plays a very big part in, in the turnover of many industries. Oh, good. Next, actually, if I could add to that, I, I would actually maybe even broaden it to say culture. You know, we talked about a lot yesterday, even around the, the employee brand, around the kind of culture that you create, not only with that line supervisor or manager, but in the entire organization. Um, and, and I just want to share one thing. Um, yesterday we talked about, or the, the challenge was, share some of the things you failed at. And, and what I would say is, I'll, I'll be the first to disclose a, a, a failure, and that is when I, took, when I went into this role a couple years ago, I made an assumption that, that it was about money. Uh, in fact, to the degree where I convinced senior leadership to go and increase start rates to be well ahead of where minimum wage was, we were actually in an, in an annual business meeting. The president announced this large uh, start rate increase, and there was very little applause whatsoever. He kind of looked at me. I'm thinking, I, I got nothing, right? Um, only to find out that, it, that there is a generational aspect that's occurring right now, and, it's, and it really has to do with, again, that cultural piece, this notion of, of purpose. We've heard a lot about purpose these last couple days, um, specifically with this Generation Z. And I thought I was an expert with the Generation Z because I have an 18-year-old son. Uh, that actually makes me not an expert. Um, <laughs> it may, couldn't pull me further from it. But, but, but this idea of flexibility, purpose, and culture are, are all really relevant topics for us right now in our industry. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's one of the things we're facing and causes of our turnover. OK. Um, yeah, so full disclosure, admission, I, I actually have a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology. And if my mother were behind me, she would say, not a real doctor, though. He's not a real doctor. <laughs> so a, a lot of my background is you know, looking at uh, research and theory and saying, OK, how do, we, how do we get our head around the turnover issue? And there's actually research from back in the 50s that says, really, there's three things that you got to think about. The first is you look at the person, 
whether or not they stay in a relationship, whether it's with their employer or a friend, it's um, are their inputs and outputs in balance, right? So again, they have a thing called a comparison level, but basically it's the same thing we've always looked at. If you're satisfied in your job, chances are you're not gonna leave, right? If you're not satisfied, chances are you wanna leave. But it doesn't work, if you just look at satisfaction, if you're doing an engagement survey, the thing you miss is, uh, the second piece of that is what they call a comparison level for alternatives. And that is, there has to be something else out there. So if you're the only employer in a town, right, the employees don't like what you're doing, but they got nowhere else to go, even though they're dissatisfied, they'll stay. What happened today is the comparison level for alternatives just ballooned, right? Um, the latest um, JOLTS report, the U.S. Department of Labor report, says there's seven million jobs out there, open jobs in the United States, right? So there's plenty of alternatives now. And so the thing that we found that got uh, changed is that um, not only are dissatisfied people, do they have alternatives, but now even your satisfied people are getting calls about jobs that are better, right? And so people will move to better opportunities. So even your satisfied employees might not stay. And then the third piece is um, what they call kind of inertia or the cost of turnover, right? So if you're going to leave, there's costs incurred in that, right? And companies try to do things to make people kind of sticky, right? And one of the things they find is the longer you've been there, the longer the probability that you're gonna stay. So higher, turn, uh, higher tenured people tend not to leave your company. And so whenever you grow, all of a sudden turnover spikes. It's because you've got a lot more people who only have a little bit of tenure. So those are kind of the theory. But for us, what we found is the biggest thing is the culture. So we, we look at um, what, um, again, what's our culture? What's our differentiator out there? So again, we're, we're pretty good uh, relative to hospitality. We're at about 22% turnover overall. I think the industry average is about 60. So we're, we're, again, pretty good. I think it's the culture, the same thing you've heard, that's kind of kept them there. So that, that's really interesting. A question about culture for all three of you, though. Does culture include compensation, or does culture include environment only? I'll start. I think, I think the whole notion of compensation and benefits or total rewards is a hygiene factor, right? I think in order to, to be in the game, you've got to be right. Um, and I know that's, again, some, some, somewhat subjective, but uh, relative to where your, your competition is, relative to, to what uh, an individual needs to make for a living wage, uh, I think you have to take those off the table. If, if you want to sell the aspe other aspects of culture, you can't let that be a disruptor or, or, or a distraction, I should say. So you would keep them separate in I'd your keep mind? Them separate. Yeah, and I would agree with that. You have to be in the ballpark. I, I think what we focus on uh, at, at Dial America, we, we, we feel that we're in the ballpark. Uh, and we really do focus on the things that you've heard a little bit earlier about the culture. Uh, we're very big. Our turnover at our corporate headquarters or most of our full-time staff is probably 5-6%. For our 3,700 part-time sales agents, it's well over 100%. And so that's a, it's, you know, we have to talk about culture. We have to make them feel as if they're part of the team because that's a never ending struggle that we, we experience. People to come work for Dial America, they want to work for two or three months. They want to pay off a bill. They want to get their kids ready for college. Uh, they, they have an immediate financial need that they want to be able to satisfy. And then they move forward and say, okay, well, I don't know if I want to do this for 25 hours a week, so I'm going to leave and maybe I'll come back in six months. So what we struggle with or what we try to achieve is if, if you worked for us for three or four months, we want it to be a good experience so that when that financial need occurs again, you're, you're very willing to come and work for us to, to satisfy that need down the road. So culture is very important to us. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about later, but we're doing some things that I think will get some eyebrows raised. Uh, what we're trying to do, the way uh, we look at things a little bit differently, but I'll, I'll hold off on that for a little bit. Yeah, great. Great. Um, did you no, want to no. So I, I worked at a startup in San Francisco about, about 10 years ago, to your point, and um, one of our engineers, he was the most amazing engineer that we had on the team. He was highly sought after, but he also loved to surf. So he'd show up 11, 12, sometimes on a Wednesday. And it became an issue for productivity for the organization to the point where we had many conversations with him. And he said, look, 
if, if you're not happy with my decision on when I want to work based on what the waves look like, I'll go across the street at lunch and I'll get another job and you won't see me again. And, and the CEO at the time, you know, said, it's not the way we do things. You made a commitment. Um, wouldn't you know, lunch comes around, the CEO's phone rings, we're standing in his office and, and the kid says, turn around. He's in the building across the street with a sign that says, I quit. So um, availability of jobs actually is, is a very real thing and that kind of shocked me back then because it, it made a big impact that if you don't have the culture to stay, um, it doesn't matter what you do, but you've got to cater to individual needs. And so I always found that fascinating and took it with me. Never found another adamant surfer like that before, but you know that, that's the way things go. So, so speaking of what you're doing in your companies to manage um, and get in front of high turnover rates, I, you all have some incredible ideas, some eyebrow raising in initiatives that are happening. Would you like to share some of your highlights, some of the things maybe that worked and maybe even something that didn't? Um, yeah, I was thinking about things and since it says Marriott, I'll steal from kind of Marriott, my previous employer. Um, no, no, they updated. Uh, all of your titles and wow. companies have been updated. That's real time. See, that's, that's agile. Like, that is agile. This is, right? this is, this is um, we, we call them Maggie's, millennials and Gen Z who get instant everything. We just got, we just got Maggie. We got instant right, everything. Okay, they good. updated it seamlessly on the fly for us. But since I was already going to say that one, I'm still going to go ahead with this. <laughs> so you think about Ritz Carlton. So I, I was in charge of HR for what was called the Southern Region, which had the, the very, um, you know, ho homogeneous, um, territory of Atlanta to Argentina, right? So there were some differences, little differences in the, in the cultures there. But Ritz-Carlton, their brand is so strong. So their, their orientation, that, like in this hotel, they'll do orientation once a month. They'll only hire people once a month. Now, my data is 10 years old, right? So they may be doing something different now. But they hire once a month, and it's a week. So every employee goes through a week of training. If it's a new hotel, like we went to the opening of, of the Ritz-Carlton in Charlotte, uh, it's actually a month-long process, right, where they go through this. And I was sitting through it, and, you know, I, I really didn't believe it. It's like, yeah, yeah, right, okay. Yeah, we, we try to get our GMs involved. They tend not to want to spend hours with new, new recruits. Um, the, with the new hotel, the actual CEO of the company comes into the hotel, and all the new employees are sitting there, and they don't call them employees. They call them ladies and gentlemen, right? At Ritz-Carlton, you're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, right? That's their... That's their mantra. And um, he sits there and he, he asks, he's French, so I'll try to do the accent. But he, he says, you know, uh, what's your name? And it's, you know, Raul. And Raul, what, what do you do? And he goes, well, I'm, I'm a steward. And he, a steward is basically dishwasher in, the, in the, the kitchen. And he says, you know, I am a very important man. I am on the boards of many companies. I make millions of dollars. But you are more important to this hotel than I am. And the guy was like all puffed up and... And that's their, whole, that's their whole thing, right? We're uh, Ritz Carlton, so you're in the top 1% when you're here, and you're very special, and you're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Their turnover rate is half of what the other brands are. They don't pay that much more, but again, the culture is one of the things they use as a differentiator, and the orientation is one. And I think about our company, we tried to push that in to some of the other brands, and you know, GMs, it's like, once a month, hiring once a month. I need to hire, HR makes me hire on payroll day. That doesn't even work for me. We need people when we need them. So again, I, I think it's, a, um, it's an issue of putting employees first, putting talent first on the chart. Great. Yeah, so for, for us, when you think of the individuals age 16 to 24, it's probably more than a third of our associate base. Um, so, so one of the things we saw very early on that one we got credit for, but it was also a reason for people leaving us was this notion of flexibility and the desire to have more hours, but the hours when only they were available and it had to be at a moment's notice, right? They didn't, they couldn't commit to you a week in advance, but later that, you know, that, that day or a day before they could have a better idea of what they could work. Um, so one of the things that we have started to pilot throughout organization, and some of you may have this as well as a, a, like a gig scheduling application. Um, to where you can, you can create a base schedule and then allow for individuals to vie for shifts that get posted as the managers need them. So imagine a snowstorm's coming, and in our business, a snowstorm, you know, you want to have every register open, you, have put, you put four more shifts out there, uh, the student says, hey, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have school tomorrow, I think I can work tonight, I'll post for that shift and have people come in. Take that one step further, the ability to work people within a market. So interesting enough that you could have a store that's four miles from another one. One store has no problem finding help. In fact, people are asking for more hours and frustrated they can't get more hours. Yet the store four miles away does. 
so they're able to post for those shifts as well, provided they're certified in those positions. And having that availability, having that flexibility allows the associate to have more hours that they're looking for when they want it, um, while also retaining those associates. So that, that was a very powerful tool, taking what we did well and then really enhancing it um, to, to target that, that, uh, that, that generational. That's really interesting. Does anybody out there in the audience have any great ideas that they've implemented that they want to share? There's a microphone in the back. Oh, great. Oh, hang on one second. We're going to bring you the mic so we can all hear it. Um, kind of a follow-up question, I think, Robert, I was, um, when you talked about really kind of looking internally and how we're helping train folks, do any of you have a dedicated workforce planning function? And if so, what types of online career assessment tools do you use? And then do you have dedicated career advisors to help those employees really understand what their possibilities are? We find, I work for uh, Lee Health, by the way, uh, 14,000 employees. So we find sometimes our leaders aren't um, as effective as they could be at talking about those career growth opportunities and don't always want to let them go. So do any of you have dedicated workforce planning functions where you have that kind of built into what you do to recruit and retain? Um, I always think our internal people were constantly re-recruiting them. Not... Yes, uh, but not, it's, it's very disparate. So we have 19 centers throughout the country. And as of now, we allow most of our, our department managers in each facility. They know their locations the best. They know their agents the best. They know their staffs the best. So we have conversations. We have meetings about the things that they're doing. But we don't have a, this is the way the corporation does it, and this is how you have to do it. So we allow for some flexibility. Uh, you know, Charleston's a little bit different than El Paso, Texas, which is a little bit different than Omaha, Omaha Nebraska. So we, we take a lot of the input from the department managers in each location uh, is kind of how we handle that process. We don't have a formalized function. What we're working on is tools to do the same thing. So is there an opportunity to have an application that um, articulates the career path that they can follow? So interesting enough, you know, and I started off when I was 15 as a part-time associate. And, and to use testimonials, showing paths similar to that, showing how people can move cross-functionally, the fact that we have this, un, I mean, again, I, imagine this, this untapped population. We, we have IT associates, we've got data scientists, we've got, I mean, every marketing, merchandising, so to be able to, to capture them in the high school while they're working for us and to show them that there's a career path through college back to us is very powerful. Uh, so we're working on to provide those digital solutions. It's very clunky right now. It's, it's PDFs and we'd like to be more interactive. Yeah, we, we certainly have it for within different functions, so within the sales. So for sales executives, they, they, they do forecasting. We have general uh, career development courses where people go through and explore, but we don't have full-time uh, career advisors for folks. That's kind of interesting. And same point you brought up. Sometimes the managers don't know. In other words, they'll know how they got there, and they'll know within sales and marketing or within HR the path. But a lot of times that's not – like we have a, a data analyst – you know, people analytics person who just got a job in the marketing department. Nobody in HR knew marketing, right? We, we didn't know what jobs were available there. And, but the skills are starting to become more transferable, and that's a great point to be able to do that. Uh, because we found, you know, on the surveys, especially with younger folks, the um, career opportunities is one of the number one reasons for, for turnover. So, good for you. <laughs> What are some of your perspectives on stay bonuses? Well, I mean, I can, I can speak to it. We're in the middle of a merger right now, so, so we have them. So kind of for, there's, and, you know, we're, we're combining two companies of equal size, about 12,000 each. Um, we're going from uh, ADP in one company and Oracle in another to Workday. And so, and we're um, going from two different payroll systems, again, to all ADP and then Workday next year, kind of two steps there, and we've, we've got them in place for that just because we need people to be able to stay until the project is, someone has to be cutting the checks in, you know, December 18th before the system cuts over. So we've, we've done those things. Uh, one of the positives that we found is um, that a lot of those people find jobs in the company. Again, 20% turnover, things will pop, 
and so sometimes somebody who you were concerned about retaining will will have another opportunity and we're you know even though they we have special severance for the merger uh, sometimes they're they they like to stay with the company again back to the culture they want to remain and so they'll find something somewhere else Matt, does that answer your question yeah, I'm, we're the same. We've, we've utilized stay bonuses during, we, uh, two years ago, we went through an integration, uh, two organizations joined each other, uh, used it not just for executive leadership, but really key, key roles of the organization to ensure continuity during that transition. And, and similarly, most of those individuals ended up finding roles. Uh, but I think it's critical when you're trying to ensure continuity of business to utilize stay bonuses. Yeah, um, you know, related to that, we're talking about fails since you started, I'll go ahead. One of, the one of the places I failed. So we actually took a page out of leadership development. If you know the, the old Zenger Folkman, the idea being, if you want to be an exceptional leader, you can't be bad at anything. You've got to be at least middle of the road at most of the competencies, and you've got to be really good at one or two or three things. You've really got to be known for that. That's kind of the model that we apply. We say, okay, we're going to be, you know, our benefits, our comp, we're going to be competitive with those, and then our culture, we're going to put that out are the fact that you can travel, discounted travel to places like this, right? We're gonna hammer those home. And now that we're not part of Marriott, we say, hey, if you, you know, we're on college campus, hey, if you come and join us versus Marriott with their 5,000 hotels, we'll promise you we don't have a resort in Secaucus, New Jersey. So you're never gonna get put in, in those kind of places. We tend to be beaches and, and resorts. So we've done that and we said, well, what could we do to really get a buzz? And we said, well, what's the number one issue that we're hearing from, from our newer employees? And it was college loan debt. And we said, okay, we've got a management development program where we hire about 60 people a year. Let's put a program together to pay off their debt, right? We'll, we'll go to the colleges with it. We'll get big buzz off of it. And, you know, they'll have to stay. You know, it's kind of an implied stay bonus that, you know, while we're doing this for you, you need to stay with the company. Uh, management, no. Well, if you do it for them, what about the other people? Why are you single? And them? So we, we failed. We weren't able to get that. But that's an idea you may want to take back from... Because I really think the first, one of the first companies in the industry to do something like that, it'll get a big buzz. I think it'll really help with recru recruiting as much as retention. So. so we couldn't use it, but feel free to go. Great. So, so speaking of recruiting, um, what other unique types of benefits or offerings are you using to recruit talent that you need? Is there anything special out there or different? Uh, well, it's, it's actually it prompted my thought when we're talking about stay bonuses. One of the things that we've done in distribution, we have a distribution center as well, is a notion of uh, retention awards for first 90 days. So 30, 60, and 90 days, we have an award set because we're confident that if we can keep them in the first 90, that our likelihood of retaining them is substantially higher. Um, so in combination with uh, referral, so we, we think some of our best associates will refer good ones, uh, especially in those kind of circumstances, we're, we're testing that. We're testing that in our e-commerce space, um, and, and it's, uh, we're having some great success. It's reduced turnover significantly, um, trying to keep them there. Because if you can get them through that, that, those, the pain of, of onboarding and, and acceptance with the group, those type of things, uh, the likelihood really increases. And we're very similar. We have retention bonuses, we have referral bonuses, we have 30, 60, 90 day incentive uh, benchmarks uh, for, for our folks. Uh, we also try to bring them into mentorship programs very quickly. If they show the skill set, the acumen to be able to do what we do, uh, we want them, although they're still considered our sales agents, they'll mentor their peers and that gives us an opportunity to find out if they have uh, what it takes to, to, to move on with the Dial America, but it also builds their confidence and gives them, they just look at the job a little bit differently. So similar to Matthew, uh, I, I guess the mentorship program would be a little bit different than what she's already communicated. Great, and, and I know Rob, you mentioned that a lot of people that work at Dial America are coming because they have extra bills. And um, I don't know if for both of your roles or for all of you out there are finding more responsibility on HR or the organization for educating about financial wellness and putting programs in place to push financial wellness. So I'd love to get your perspectives on that. Yeah, we, had, we have different, um, we had a program called, no, I'm forgetting it. It was based on the Love Them or Leave Them book. Right, where you, you look at those, um, you, you look at all different opportunities, and that was one of the things we put in place was a financial wellness. And the first uh, couple sessions we had, it was amazing the variability in the people who were there. So we had some folks 
who were coming in and they wanted to know, well, in the 401k, you know, what's the difference between the aggressive risk and the 2050 fund? And what, do, right? And then you had other people say, yeah, what is this budgeting thing? I, you know, how do you do that? How do you set up a budget? And, you know, if, if I've maxed out, I actually got this question. I have five credit cards and they're all maxed out. What should I do? And it's like, you know, I, I'll pick the smallest one and go after that. <laughs> I, I don't know what to, what to tell them. But it, um, yeah, it, I, I think people say it again. Marriott, right, the founder of Marriott, and now there's other companies doing it, but JW Marriott said, you know, take care of your employees, they'll take care of the customers, the customers will keep coming back, and the money will take care of itself. That's kind of, in a, in a nutshell, that's kind of the culture of Marriott and Marriott Vacations, right? That's the DNA. So they're always looking for, well, the take care of employees, what does that mean? And so, again, financial services uh, is one of the things that, we, that we've offered along with you know, we, we also put together a string of, um, you know, free benefits, you know, dog, you know, pet insurance and things like that, that you're, really, you're not going to make it part of your annual, um, you know, your, your open enrollment period, but still things that folks want. Um, so this actually is an area that's uh, I'm somewhat uh, personal connection with, and, and that is, it, it, again, for the last few years, one of the ways we've tried to activate culture is through volunteerism. Um, you know, we found that our associates want to give their time more than their money, and certainly because it it's, it's a bit easier for them. Um, and as we were doing a volunteer event, it was actually, we had uh, some department managers and some of our stores, and uh, we were at a food bank helping out. And in conversation with these individuals, found out that, and by the way, our department managers are, I'd say, fairly well, in my mind, compensated, certainly more than your full-time or part-time population found out that they were users, they, 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 were, they were clients of the food bank that we were in. And so this notion of food insecurity hit me pretty, pretty hard, that, that here, here are management within our stores struggling to put uh, food on their table um, and, and to make ends meet, um, needing to take public transportation to get to work because they, they couldn't find the, the, the means to, to, to buy a vehicle. Um, so, you know, that's what started our, we, we're just now involving and in, in getting involved in a relationship with uh, a, a large credit union in, in the state to not only do digital training, but on-site training, on-site counseling throughout the year. Because we know, one, people, people have, you know, there's a lot of pride associated with it. They, they, you know, they're looking for advice, how, how to balance a checkbook, how to, how to make ends meet, how to save money. Um, so that, that this is this is a, a pretty important topic. We've also established a rainy day fund. I'm not sure if your organizations have them, but in times of need, in times of financial strife, to have a fund that our associates put money into uh, collectively, it, it, it's, it's actually the highest percentage um, bucket that our organization uh, in a charitable giving puts it into. It's, so we call it Helping Hands, and it's there for, for those events as well um, because it's, it's such a large issue that's facing our workforce right now. So. Uh, something a little bit different, that, uh, to adding to what Jonathan and Matt already said. Uh, we, we've developed uh, we, what we call ERCs, which is Employee Relations Committees, and we have agents join those committees, and they are the sounding boards for what it is that the agents want, where fellow agents can talk to them about what they like about the job, what they don't like about the job, and then more specifically around this topic, what would they like to do as a group that will make a difference in the neighborhood, in, in the community. So uh, we get a lot of feedback in terms of uh, who can we help. We, we have, very often we have potlucks. Uh, we'll go to the food banks to do things that bring people together. I, I don't know if this will be a shock, but being on the phone for an hour and talking to 40 people and having 37 of them tell you that they don't want anything to do with what you're trying to sell them is a little negative. So anything that we can provide for our agents to feel good about what it is that they do and understand the bigger picture and really being part of their community, giving back to those that are less fortunate than them, uh, it, it makes you feel good not only about themselves, but it, it develops a relationship between coworkers that maybe they'll start having some friendships outside of work. And, and another thing that we do is on top of the financial wellness that's also come out of this ERC concept, uh, we do a lot of stuff for mental health, and we, we, we push people, uh, push is the wrong word, we, we direct people to services that are available in, in the area uh, for, you know, they don't often want to talk about the things that are affecting them uh, because they're embarrassed, they're shy, they don't feel it's anyone else's problem, but when you're dealing with peers versus a management group, 
uh, they're, they're more open to being open and honest, and, and we, we find ways that we can get them the support and services that they need without making it a big deal, not embarrassing them, but it gives them support and some help that is also helping to reduce our turnover in ways that five, six, seven years ago we would never even thought of. Great. That's great. There's some really great ideas here, and I think you've all mentioned... Um, you know, different ideas, thinking out of the box, establishing culture. You've all mentioned payroll systems. In the last session, we saw how the chief technology officers or the CIOs are working more closely with HR. Payroll clearly is, is working more closely with that. And, and Rob, I know that in addition to everything that you've mentioned, you're also using daily pay to right. give access to your employees to get paid on demand. Yes. So is that something that you see additive to all of this or a separate initiative? Yes, our, our experience with daily pay is, has been very positive. Uh, the way we, we pay our, our agents is if they started on Monday the 1st, they don't receive their first paycheck until Tuesday the 16th. So that's a long time to go without receiving your first paycheck. And you know, we might experience 10, 15, 18% turnover in the first two weeks, primarily because they don't have access to those funds that they need them. Plus, based on where we're at in the marketplace, um, it's a sales environment, and they're just looking at if, if my guarantee is nine fifty or ten dollars an hour, I'm going to go work for a job that's making ten fifteen, because it's more money. Well, the reality is, if you give us thirty days, forty five days, you'll be making far more than ten fifteen. But it's it's the I need it now, and so what Daily Pay has done, uh, hence the name. If you're not familiar, it allows employees access to their monies really come day two. So it, it's a benefit and we have reduced the turnover by six and a half basis points since we've implemented daily pay, which is a phenomenal uh, reduction and it's been very valuable for our, for our industry and, and the feedback we get from our agents uh, for some of our long-term agents is, man, why didn't you do this years ago? And certainly for the newer agents, they don't know any better, but the reality is, is they get access to their monies and it allows them to give us the time to train them, to teach them how to do the job because if we can get them past the two-week mark, the 30-day the mark, we have a far greater uh, chance of retaining them and them working for us for, for a foreseeable amount of time. Um, so my last question, and then we'll open it up for a few questions, is, so the cost of turnover ranges in an organization anywhere from $1,600 per employee up to 4000 in some organizations. Are any of you tasked with a goal where you have to look at the reduction of the cost of turnover by looking at reduced turnover? Do you, are you... Looking at, are your goals being monetized in that way that you're saving the company X hundred thousand dollars by reducing turnover, or is it just something holistically that you're trying to do as an organizational initiative? I, I try to work the cost of turnover into every return on investment proposal <laughs> that I submit, um, and that usually doesn't work out well. It, it is it is an overarching, uh, you know, obviously, uh, initiative uh, regardless of our, our job. So we 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 manage turnover by the percentage. Yeah, I just got a general question since we got about three minutes left here. Um, I, I had I, I like um, like speaking and attending these because sometimes your your brain goes somewhere different when you have to you realize you're going to have to be up here and defending stuff you do. And I had this really weird thought, which is, I, I think we're being boiled. You, you know the old adage about the boiling the frog that if you do it slowly. So I was looking at numbers. Right, there's 7.1 million open jobs in the United States. Right. There's 5.8 million unemployed Americans, right? So if you took every unemployed American, you jammed them into a job, there's a million jobs that can't be filled with the current workforce, right? So why are we still having, why are we still treating um, in business talent like it's not the short, the, you know, it's not in short supply, right? It's easier to get dollars now, right? The un uh, you know, the interest rates are low, a lot of companies have a lot of cash flow, that's it. Information, not a problem anymore. You can go on the net, you can get anything. But talent is really the restricting thing. But I don't know about your companies, but in ours, that's not the, that's not the uh, arguments and the discussions we're having. Like when we go in again talking about the, um, you know, let's do this program to reduce, um, you know, to attract people who will pay off student loans. It's like, well, no, what do the shareholders say about that? What? That shouldn't be the discussion we're having anymore. 
right? I think talent is the limiting factor in a lot of companies, but HR, we're still, I think we got boiled, right? We're, we're, keeping, we're trying to do little things better. We're, we're trying to do different kinds of things, like we'll do, um, you know, part-time folks for our call centers and let them work for a hose so we are getting a different workforce. But we're not having the agreement, like nobody's going in and saying, well, listen, I'm, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cut by, um, um, you know, we're going to have to cut marketing because we really need the resources to attract talent, right? Nobody, n nobody's having those debates. So anyway, that was my epiphany at uh, 10 o'clock last night. So. <laughs> All right, we literally have 44 seconds left. So <laughs> with that said, does anybody have a final comment? I, mean, I think we're going to run out of time for questions, but obviously you can speak at networking and, and dinners. Any comments? No, I just... Uh... You know, you have me perplexed in thinking, but uh, I will tell you one of the things that we're doing to address it is because there's a larger gap of need versus what's available, you know, the, the challenge for us, I think, in all of our businesses is to rethink the way work is done. Uh, so I know there's a future of work stream going on as well. I think that's also part of what we need as HR professionals to really be investing in our time. Right, and thank you so much. This has been wonderful, very enlightening, and hopefully everyone got a lot out of it. Please give them a nice round of applause. Thank you.